Great to see you guys all out and about early this morning. I hope everybody is ready for a really exciting, fun-filled day here at Discovery Park of America. Our first speaker up today uh, needs no introduction, but I will introduce him anyway. Dr. David Coffey is Professor of History and Chair of the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of Tennessee at Martin, where he offers classes in U.S., military, and Mexican history. He's published many, many books and has contributed chapters to many um, others, including well-regarded anthologies on Civil War, Mexican, and Texas history. A book he recently wrote, along with Gene Smith, In Harm's Way, A History of the American Military Experience, was recently selected to teach military history to students at West Point. We have some of David's book up in the Real Foot Room, and he's going to pop up there after this segment to autograph and meet and answer questions and talk with you. Uh, little known fact, David and I actually went to the same high school in Fort Worth, Texas. I'm a lot older than him, and he's a lot cooler than me, so we didn't hang out together, but it is fun that we both uh, know some of the same people. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. David Coffey. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming out. I have a very informal chat for you today. I, uh, I was asked to talk about this book, In Harm's Way, and, and sort of the process we went through in, in writing the book and, and uh, how we designed it, and really what we learned in doing it. It was really a rewarding process for me. And, one of the cool things was it enabled me to access years and years and years of, of work on military publications. I've been tremendously lucky over the years in my academic experience, going back to my graduate school days, one of the first things I got to do was work on an encyclopedia of the Vietnam War. And uh, I didn't know anything about the Vietnam War except for what was popularly known. And so it was, it was a tremendous learning experience for me. And it started me on a path. I've now worked on encyclopedias on Vietnam, on U.S. military history, on the Indian Wars in North America, a six-volume history of the Civil War, or encyclopedia of the Civil War. And working on encyclopedias was a really good way to gain exposure to an awful lot of different topics. So one of the other great things about my academic experience is getting to meet people and getting to work with, with talented and passionate individuals. And one of those was a professor I worked with at, where I went to college at TCU in Fort Worth, Texas. Professor Gene Smith, who works in the early American period. He does a lot of Navy history, too. And a few years ago, he started talking about wanting to publish a textbook on American military history. And there's a need for that, strangely enough. The, um, there are a bunch of good books, but they're not exactly written for lower level college students. Uh, some of them, like the, the Army puts out a great two volume history, but it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty in depth and, and a little intimidating for, for college students. There are a couple of other books that are a little over the head. So we wanted something that was accessible, something that was entertaining, something that was personalized that, that really resonated. And we also wanted something that was more reflective of the total American military experience. There's a tendency in the public for, among people who haven't served to think in terms of battles and wars and guns and airplanes when so much of the military experience is personal. 
it's 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 mundane it but it's also protecting citizens it it's it's uh, enforcing peace it's it's infrastructure it's it's an that's some of the coolest stuff about studying the American military history is all the different things that went into it. So we, when we started writing this book, I remember Gene, Gene was visiting my wife Julie and me here in, in Union City and he was talking about how he couldn't find anybody to write this book with him and I said, He'd never really thought about it. So, okay. So then we uh, enlisted uh, a really well-known historian by the name of Kyle Longley, who, who works more in, in the modern period, the post-World War II period. He's written some good stuff on Vietnam and international relations. And, and so uh, we divided it up. Gene Smith did the first six chapters that go from the colonial period up through the revolution, the War of 1812, and the U.S. War with Mexico. And then I pick it up with the end of the war in Mexico, and I take it all the way up to World War II. And that was, that was a challenging deal to, to really cover that, that period because there was such change during that time. And then Kyle Longley picks it up at World War II and brings it to the present. And so we have three different voices, three distinctive sections of the book, but it somehow works pretty well together because we picked up on a formula. We start each chapter with a little vignette, usually featuring an individual or individuals and telling a, a story of, of their experience. And I'll use some of my examples um, from, from my five chapters. Uh, I started off with a, a little vignette on, on Randolph Marcy, who was a, a tremendously interesting soldier, a career officer in the United States Army, who was a, an engineering officer, did a lot of exploration in the West. And he was in the Army for 30 years and was still a captain. So I used him as an example of the slow promotion in the, the pre-Civil War Army and how these dedicated professionals helped change, helped change history because they, they ended up fighting in the Civil War and then extending into the post-Civil War Indian Wars period. Some of them had careers that, that spanned almost 50 years. And then... Um, in the chapters, we also include a, a section we call Issues in Military History, where we look at a controversial topic or, or one that's open for debate. And in that chapter, I, I looked at was the uh, Civil War the first modern war? And that's not an easy answer. Because if, if you look at in terms of technology, yes. In terms of tactics, not so much. Um, despite some of the things we, we assume about the Civil War, like the importance of the rifled musket, well, that recent research has kind of flipped some of those, those long-held beliefs. So it was an interesting way to approach the chapter, but the... Um, but dealing with things like the uh, formation of the first cavalry regiments in, in, the, in the 1850s and, and how the politics of, of sectional rivalry kicked in and, and affected the officer corps in the, in the regular army. A lot of different issues at play in the 1850s, like the importation of camels. That's, that's one of the coolest stories from the pre-Civil War period when Secretary of War Jefferson Davis decided that would be a good way to move men and supplies across the Southwest. Brought in 75 camels from the Middle East and, and handlers to, to train and, and, and take care of those camels. It didn't work out 
it might have had the Civil War not come along, who knows? But there's some cool stories about camels roaming the desert southwest for years after the Civil War. So that was a fun chapter to work on, that 1850 to 1861 or 1862, the first couple of years of the Civil War. It was, uh, it's a period we don't spend a lot of time looking at because it didn't involve a big war. But it was a really important period in terms of the development of, of the U.S. military. The regular army matured, got more professional. Then I get into, uh, the second chapter I did was the Civil War, uh, the bulk of the Civil War from the end of 1862 through the end of the war. And uh, with the big battles, with, with Gettysburg and the Overland Campaign, the, the big campaigns in the West, and um, the ultimate uh, Appomattox Campaign. And uh, the vignette for that, for that uh, chapter, I can't remember. <laughs> um, but uh, the, uh, the issues in military history uh, dealt with the, uh, the lost cause and the uh, development of the lost cause narrative in the South. And um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a useful chapter in, in um, just coming to grips with the war, the human side of the war, the co contribution of African-American soldiers to winning their own freedom. 180,000 African-Americans served in the United States Army during the Civil War and, and more than 25,000 in the Navy. So uh, it's, it's a big story. It's a big piece. Then um, the, the next chapter is uh, the post-Civil War period dealing with the, uh, the Indian Wars uh, up through the, uh, the Battle of Wounded Knee. And I start with a vignette on an officer by the name of Charles Gatewood, who uh, was a, one of the first Southerners to graduate from West Point after the Civil War. And uh, he uh, languished as a, as a lieutenant in the West, uh, in one of the cavalry units in the West, but uh, began to work with Indian scouts, particularly uh, among the Apaches in Arizona. And he was instrumental in bringing in Geronimo in the 1880s. But then he was badly wounded in a fire uh, when his regiment was transferred to the Northern Plains and ended up uh, re retiring for medical reasons, as a, still as a lieutenant after, after about 20, 20 years in, in, in the service, never getting quite the recognition or the appreciation he deserved. So we use, we use Gatewood to show that there was a, um, a, a sad human side to the, to the story as well. It wasn't all glory. We didn't just focus on the heroes. And, and then the, uh, the next chapter was the dealing with the United States and its expanding role internationally, going from um, a, a more inward-looking nation to, a, to an outward-looking nation and the development of an American empire, overseas possessions. And in reality, the United States had already been doing that, of course, by uh, um, claiming islands in the Pacific and the Caribbean. But uh, really, in the years following the Civil War, acquiring Midway, acquiring Alaska, acquiring um, Samoa, getting involved in Hawaii, and then, of course, the, the war with Spain landed the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Guam. And, and so we look at, we look at the development of, of of a more international military and uh, the military now with overseas occupation, developing um, infrastructure in places like Cuba and the Philippines. And um, it's, uh, uh, we, um, we end the, the, the previous chapter with a discussion of the, the, the Battle of Wounded Knee and um, whether that was a massacre and 
or, or was it just a, a tragic event? And then we look at the, uh, the questions of empire in the next chapter. Uh, the, uh, the example I use in the, in the vignette is mar the, the great Marine hero, Smedley Butler. And if you're not familiar with General Butler, you want to look him up. It's a great story of a, an absolute third world warrior. He, he, he was involved in the Marine interventions in the Caribbean, in Haiti, in Nicaragua. He fought in China. He fought in the Philippines. He fought in World War I. He took a t leave of absence to lead the Philadelphia Police Department. And then he became a pacifist, an anti-war activist. Uh, just a fascinating story. Uh, Two-time Medal of Honor recipient, retired a two-star general in the Marine Corps. Um, just a, a fascinating dude. And then my final chapter was the First World War and the interwar years. And again, this was fascinating stuff too because uh, I started off with a discussion of, of the um, African American offers, officers in World War I and the, uh, the effort that the United States made to, um, to train and provide opportunities and, and the importance of that opportunity for a generation of, of African American officers. And you, if you want to learn more about that, I suggest you stick around and listen to uh, my colleague, Dr. Adam Wilson, this afternoon in the panel at 1 o'clock, um, because I used his research in that, in that chapter. Um, the uh, the uh, issues at, in war, issues in American military history for that chapter dealt with was the United States the decisive force in winning World War I. Uh, that's a controversial topic. Clearly the United States didn't suffer as much or, or contribute as much as, as the European armies, but would the Allies have won without the United States contribution? Likely not. In fact, it was one of the German generals who suggested that the United States was the decisive force in World War I. Not so much because of the military contribution, but just the, the effect that the insertion of fresh U.S. troops at the end of the war was just too much. And um, there, there's a good case to be made there. But then we get, uh, and we, when we get into the later chapters, uh, it gets more personalized. Uh, Professor Longley looks at a, a number of very interesting cases. Um, the, the, uh, the chapters on Vietnam are particularly poignant, and um, they need to be. Uh, we, uh, we have so much we can still learn from the American military experience and one of the interesting things that, that we deal with, especially in the later chapters, is lessons unlearned. Because one of the things that, that, one of the stories, one of the narratives that we build in the book is the evolution of the American military establishment from the m militia traditions in a country that really didn't trust or want a professional military through a, a war that required large national armies and involved modern technology, professional soldiers, professional training, the development of academies. Um, and then finally, when we get to the, the 20th century, the, the various roles that the United States occupied. And then, the, the World War II effect. The success in World War II really kind of jaded the, the, the Army particularly. And um, when we get into Vietnam, our leaders, many of them, forgot the lessons that had been learned over the 200 previous years of evolution. Uh, success in small, unconventional warfare against 
not only Native Americans, but insurgents in Nicaragua or Haiti. Uh, Fifteen years of bitter fighting in the Philippines. It, 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 was a, it was a varied experience, and the United States particularly got very good at it. Um, and then in, when we get to Vietnam, we try to fight a conventional war against a very unconventional foe with, uh, well, with less than desirable results. So some of the stuff that I found most interesting in my experience in writing this book um, because I had to learn new stuff. Uh, I, I'm a Civil War guy, and um, I'm thrilled to have my, uh, my colleague, Dr. Tim Smith, with us today. Stick around and listen to his, his uh, chat with uh, Scott a little later today. That's going to be right after this. So um, you probably saw Professor Smith doing... Uh, 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 his his uh, great job on the on the Grant series on the History Channel that was just really well done. Anyhow, I learned a lot because I had to. I didn't know much about the Great War. Uh, I, I had to do research, and that was fun. One of the things, though, that I found the most interesting was learning about the evolution of the Marines from. Basically, the, uh, the support troops for, for the Navy into a, a legitimate branch in their own right. The Marines evolved not only the, the branch, but ta tactics, um, amphibious warfare doctrine, um, but also, the Marines became very adept at civil engagement. Um, and one of the few success stories in Vietnam was what the, Marine, uh, the Marines were able to do in engaging at the village level. Um, so, but you get these great stories of the Marines, like Smedley Butler and this core of, of Marine officers that transformed the Corps. In, into uh, what it became in World War II, a main battle component. And of course, much of the fighting in the Pacific during World War II would be, would be done by the Marines. So it's, it, was a, uh, it was an interesting experience for, for, uh, for me, and it, it was an opportunity to show the importance of the American military. And not, again, not just as, a, as an instrument of war. Some of the coolest stories involve the, the Army stepping in to supervise the Civilian Conservation Corps during, during the Great Depression and the New Deal. The uh, tremendous work that, that Army engineers did to survey the, the, the West for railroads, the, um, the technological advancement, the social advancement that the military was at the forefront um, uh, of producing change, the, um, the creation of, of uh, it, the integration of the Army in the, in the years following the Civil War, when Congress mandated African-American regiments. And those regiments went on to become legendary, the Buffalo Soldiers. And, and that legacy extended to World War II when entire African-American divisions served in, in World War I and World War II, before President Truman desegregated the military in one of the great social transformations in our, in our recent history. So, it's a big story, and it's a whole lot more than, than wars. And one thing we tried to do, tried to avoid, was the glorification. We, we wanted to be honest with, with the content. We didn't, we didn't want to spin stories of, of glorious charges and, 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 and flying flags. And 
we wanted to try to tell the story of humans and, and emphasize the destructive nature of war, but also the productive nature of other endeavors, whether it was opening up trade, protecting U.S. business interests, whether that's positive or not, uh, is debatable. But uh, one of the things that, that Smedley Butler regretted was that he, he, he called himself a racketeer for, for American business, Con comparing himself to Al Capone and other gangsters. But he said, Al Capone did it in one city. We did it on three continents. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a, um, a pretty cool story, and it was a great experience. And um, I, uh, I need to shut it down here pretty soon. But uh, are there any questions? I'd, I'd be happy to answer a, a couple of questions if you have any. Yes. Oh, yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, we learned this, um, this semester that the United States Military Academy at West Point has adopted the book for their required class. Uh, I think it's Military History 101 or something like that. Um, every cadet it will get this book in, the, in their first year. That's 1,200 copies. So uh, we're thrilled about that. <laughs> uh, but the fact that you know, the Army has its own textbook, and for West Point to adopt this book was a, was a real affirmation for, for us. And uh, really, we wrote this book for teachers. We wrote this book for students. Uh, and we wrote it to be readable. We wrote it to be accessible. But we also wanted a good teaching tool. And, and we think we got it. Um, I've used the book now in my own class. I teach the American military history class, and Dr. Smith does too, um, at UT Martin. And ROTC cadets are required to take that class. So um, it's, it's been fun to be able to use the book in, in teaching future officers. It, um, nothing could make me more, more uh, proud of, 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 of a, a project and then maybe having a role in the education of, of, of future leaders. Thank you for asking that. All right. Well, I, yes, yes, sir. Did you come across the involvement of the Salvation Army in your research during World War II? Uh, I, I did not do world, the World War II chapter, so I, I, I didn't get to the Salvation Army personally, but uh, uh, I, um, and I, I, I don't know, I can't remember if Professor Longley touches on that or not in his chapter, but uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer there. Yes, sir. After our significant victory after World War II, we established us having a significant Navy, okay? Right. And we still have a significant right. Navy. And it's my opinion that we have the most significant Navy. Can you talk about how important it is that we have this significant Navy as a global power? Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's an excellent point. And, and that's one that I think we make pretty well in this, in this book. Um, I know in the chapters that I do, I talk about the, the Navy's role in opening up the uh, Pacific for, for the United States, uh, whether it was the opening of Japan in, in 1853 when, when the U.S. Uh, squadron sailed into the Tokyo Harbor with the, with the guns loaded and rolled out and the steam puffing out of the, out of the uh, engines. And uh, the, you know, then the significant role the Navy played in the Civil War. Um, the, that, and that was a tremendous advantage for the United States in that, in that conflict. But then in the, in the post-war, you know, there was a real decline for, for a few years. But then 
that, that those expansionists got into it. We started building the, the new battleships and um, the Great White Fleet. And by uh, World War I, the Navy was contributing to, uh, to the war effort in a huge way. And then one of the big stories in World War II is the superiority of the U.S. Navy, um, especially in the Pacific. I mean, it was never close. And when, the, when that war started, the United States was in a position to be competitive simply because of the Navy. The Army wasn't close, but the Navy was ready. And so from the, from the first conflict, Coral Sea, Midway, it was, a, it was win after win after win. And the, uh, as you mentioned, the, the Navy um, ha, has not yielded superiority since. And um, it, it, it's, it's always been at the cutting edge of technology since, since the late 1800s, and um, it's, uh, it still is. And it gives, it gives the United States uh, capabilities that, uh, that are often underappreciated. If you look at the success of the Gulf War, for example, um, the Navy was huge in that. So thanks for that question. Dr. Smith's chapters on uh, uh, the uh, early period are, are really good on the Navy because he's a Navy guy. Uh, he's a Navy historian. So, All right. Thank you so much.